Should we all stop being so gloomy about the UK economy? Should we stop going on about collapsing public services, a cost of living crisis and wages which have stagnated for 13 years? Well, that's the message from our Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, today. He's been giving a speech arguing against declinism and pointing to the bright side of the British economy. It wasn't always convincing. Um, Myself and Aaron Bastani will be speaking about that as our first story. He's going to be joining me in a few moments. Tonight, we also um, have the boomer crooners who have turned against the Conservatives. And a blast from the past, a historic video of Nadim Zahawi, which you don't want to miss. Um, We do want to know your comments and your questions throughout the show. Um, You can post those on the hashtag Tisky Sour or put them in the comments. Do you think we should all start speaking more positively about the British economy? Let us know. Jeremy Hunt today gave what was billed as his first big speech as Chancellor. His message, it's time to cheer up about the British economy declinism about Britain is just wrong. It's always been wrong in the past, and it's wrong today. Some of the gloom is based on statistics that don't reflect the whole picture. Like every G7 country, our growth was slower in the years after the financial crisis than before it. But since 2010, the UK has grown faster than France, Japan, and Italy, not at the bottom, but right in the middle of the pack. Since the Brexit referendum, we've grown at about the same rate as Germany. Yes, we've not returned to pre-pandemic employment or output levels, but an economy that contracted 20% in a pandemic still has nearly the lowest unemployment for half a century. And whilst our public sector continues to recover more slowly than we would like from the pandemic, strengthening the case for reform, our private sector has grown 7.5% in the last year. Yes, inflation has risen, but it's still lower than in 14 EU countries, with interest rates rising more slowly than in the US or Canada. And yes, we have to improve our productivity, but output per hour worked is now higher than pre-pandemic. So the good news there was that since 2010, we've grown faster than France, Japan and Italy. And since the Brexit referendum, we've grown at about the same rate as Germany. But there might be another metric people care more about. This chart is from The Economist, which I assume was one of the declinist newspapers Hunt was taking umbrage with. Now, it shows median household income per person. As you can see, the median British earner now makes considerably less than their peers in the USA, Canada, Australia, Germany, and France. And for us, the arrows are all pointing in the wrong direction. However, whichever metric you care about, Hunt said he wasn't just giving a speech to argue about statistics. And this was a telling moment in terms of what the speech was really for. In the audience, we've got leaders from Meta, Microsoft, Amazon, Apple, and Google, the world's largest tech companies, all with major operations in the UK. We've got Monzo and Revolut, shining examples from our world-beating fintech sector. We have founders and CEOs from some of our most exciting UK technology companies like Proximy and Matilon. You are vital for Britain's economic future, but Britain is vital for your future too. So I want to ask all of you to help our country achieve something that is both ambitious and strategic. I want to ask you to help turn the UK into the world's next Silicon Valley. So that was Jeremy Hunt begging big tech firms to invest in the UK. And to make that happen, he promised government policy would be guided by what he calls the four E's, not pills, not party drugs. They are enterprise, education, employment, and everywhere. Employment there is a reference to lowering the number of people who are economically inactive. The everywhere is apparently a reference to levelling up. Now, education and enterprise, you can kind of, uh, you can guess what they mean, can't you? Despite the impressive alliterations, though, businesses weren't impressed. This is from the FT. Kitty Usher, chief economist at the Institute of Directors, complained Hunt did not have any new policies to announce, saying the speech was E for empty. Sassy. 
She said there was a gap in the Chancellor's rhetoric, adding, while of course we should seek to ensure that firms operating at the frontier of new technology can come to Britain and thrive, our future growth path also depends on the many millions of individual decisions taken by leaders of smaller businesses across all sectors. We also have Siobhan Haviland, Director General of the British Chambers of Commerce. She said that beyond some existing pledges, including using reform of EU-era insurance regulations known as Solvency II to unlock infrastructure investment, there was very little meat in Hunt's speech. And Stephen Phipson, Chief Executive of Make UK, which represents manufacturers, said there was some hugely damaging big picture issues caused by the absence of an industrial strategy, which are impacting on some of our strategic sectors. This claim from Jeremy Hunt that, you know, Britain needs to be the next Silicon Valley My God, for people who are getting on a bit, such as myself, this has been said by consecutive prime ministers since the 1990s. We had it since Blair. Cameron said it. Who who remembers Silicon Roundabout? That was on City Road. Apparently, that was going to be Britain's answer to um, the innovation uh, centre of the West. And it's still just a roundabout uh, with a few nice coffee bars around it. So the tunes are nothing new. And I think basically this just speaks to the extent of desperation when it comes to the Conservative Party and, and, and how they're all out of ideas, policies, proposals to make profitable businesses here in the UK. They haven't had a growth model in this country since 2008. I've said that repeatedly. For a brief period of time after that, they had the sort of the political cover that allowed them to evade the big questions on policy and growth, which was austerity. Growth could come second. It doesn't really matter too much because we need to cut the deficit. And once we cut the deficit, everything will be fine. And that lasted all the way through to 2016, and of course, Brexit. Then, of course, the Tory party decided to sacrifice the country so that they could keep party unity over that issue. And that's, of course, all the way through to 2020. And then finally, post-COVID, we're having a serious conversation about the complete absence of growth in this country. Now, for the best part of 16, 15 years. Um, and if you don't have rising growth, you generally aren't going to have rising living standards unless you have an, a massive, extraordinary redistribution of wealth which, of course, the Conservative Party is not interested in. Increasingly, it should be said, Sam seem, seems to apply to Labour. So what does business think about the Tories? Well, what's interesting with this, Michael, is that every step of the way, really through to 2019, the business elite in this country love the Tories. In 2010, the Financial Times, which now is, is ruining the day the Conservative Party implemented austerity, in 2010, they were saying, vote Tory. You can go read the editorial from May 2010. In 2015, the entire business press and the Times were saying, vote Tory. The independent newspaper, which is supposed to be, you know, a liberal centrist paper, said we need the coalition to carry on, but for it to be a little bit more liberal. Uh, the only newspaper which was backing Labour in 2010, the only mainstream newspaper, was the Mirror. Even the Guardian said vote Lib Dem. And in 2015, those were the only two papers that backed Labour, the Daily Mirror and the Guardian. Of course, in 2019, the entirety of the media savaged Labour. And so I find it very difficult for the business class, particularly finance media, finance journalism, like the Financial Times, The Economist, they love to pose themselves as so clever, so smart, so erudite. These are the people cheering the Conservative Party on for the best part, well, of more than 10 years. So now I think they're recalcitrant. Now I think they're regretful. But all you need to do is Google Financial Times editorial 2010 general election, 2015 general election, And you can see that those are the very people to blame for the the situation we now find ourselves in. We haven't seen much contrition from The Economist and from the FT and all of these people who back the policies which have now left us in the position we're in. I mean, I presume they'll argue that Brexit had a lot to do with it and they didn't back Brexit, of course, but they did back austerity, which I think is at least 50% of the problem. Do you think business are going to back Labour at the next election, potentially quite proactively? I think so. I I would even go as far to say, Mike, because I think The Times will back Labour at the next election. Hmm. I think that parts of the Murdoch empire will back Labour at the next election. I don't think Talk TV will, excuse me. <clears throat> I don't think The Sun will, because I think it's too far at odds with their brand. Uh, but I think The Times, The Sunday Times, I think they will back Labour, yes. Because, and quite rightly, I think they'll view Keir Starmer as a better helmsman for a country in crisis, and which seems to be going from bad to worse. I think that's astute. I think that's. I think you'd have to be completely delusional to think otherwise, to think that it would be the Conservatives instead. And ultimately, these people are looking at <clears throat> rising interest rates, high inflation, low growth, political risk. And they've got a lot of wealth on the on the table here, Michael, that they, they could lose. 
right? If your property portfolio in London is looking at a 20 or 25% drop because we genuinely go into a big, long national decline and have another 10 years like the last 10, um, that's a lot on the line. So they say, you know what? Let's just keep the housing market propped up. Let's look after financial services. Okay, let's spend 5% more on public service than we do under the Tories. Labour aren't going to do very much more, but they'll do a little bit more. And that's worth it because it'll keep the show on the road for the five, 10 years. And you know what? I can get my pension at the end of it and my house price doesn't go down in value. And the older I get, Michael, the more I realize all of these people in public life, Michael, all of these, excuse my French, because I know some children listen to this, fuckers, all these fuckers in public life, in business, in the media, a lot of them are just waiting to retire. A lot of them are just waiting to retire. They just don't want their pension pot to decline in value. They don't want their property portfolio and their assets to decline in value. And they just want to, you know, just sit tight another five, 10 years, and I'm all right, Jack. And that, frankly, is the attitude that we have at the heart of business, at the heart of, of, of politics and media in this country by the elite. And it's taking the country to hell in a handcart. There's more bad news for the Tories this week. They've lost what was once one of their core demographics, 78-year-old classic crooners. One of them called in as a surprise guest when Sky News hosted a phone-in on the NHS. What are your thoughts on what the government should be doing about NHS workers who want decent pay and they want conditions, they want to save the NHS in their words? Absolutely. They're not asking for a great deal. Um, I personally have been a Tory for a long time. I think this government should stand down now and give the Labour Party a go at it because this is heartbreaking for the nurses. It really is heartbreaking. In all my years of living in this country, I've never seen it so bad. Mm. And anything I can do to help, go on the nurses, I'm on your side. <laughs> um, I'm sure you have family members who have used the NHS as well. Like you said, there are... Um, people like yourself lucky enough to be able to afford private care. And that's something that more and more people are exploring, whether they're wealthy, middle income earners or are just scraping the money together to help themselves or family members. How, is it, how important is it that we have a health service, a national health service that is free at the point of entry from the cradle to the grave, if you like? How important is it that the NHS stays as it is and isn't privatised? Or is that somewhere, some way of saving it, privatising it in part? Well, maybe there's somewhere down the middle. You know, if we're going to privatise it, 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 it could become terribly expensive. Um, uh, as for my family, my immediate family and all my kids, I'm lucky enough to send them to, to, to private service. But uh, I don't know. This is, this is a bad time for us in Great Britain. It really is. Change the bloody government. <laughs> OK. <laughs> well, Sir Ross Stewart, you're sure. making your political, political points very clear here on Sky News. Do you have to point out, obviously, that people do have other views? And, you know, we have had callers on here saying, give Rishi Sunak a chance. They promised to sort out um, the National Health Service and other issues facing the company, uh, country. But, of course, you know, um, the government have been around for over a decade now, which is the counterpoint to this argument. Rod Stewart isn't the only veteran pop superstar to have lashed out at our Tory government this week. Mick Hucknall from Simply Red has also got involved. He tweeted this, For me, it's personal. When I was six years old, the NHS saved my life. The lying Tories want to privatise to profit their shareholder supporters. Don't let them get away with it. Hashtag support the strikes. Love M. So Mick Hucknall. It is important to say, unlike Rod Stewart, Mick Hucknell isn't a lifelong Tory, and he was actually a donor to Labour under Tony Blair, but he's no lefty. In 2015, he praised the electorate for rejecting Marxist Labour. Remember, that was under Ed Miliband. And he went on to proactively campaign against Corbyn. Um, this is a Sun headline from the time. Simply blue, lifelong Labour voter Mick Hucknell says he can't support the party because of Jeremy Corbyn. The Simply Red singer warned that Corbyn cannot be trusted as Prime Minister. Now, I love this headline because this is a classic of the Corbyn era. Lifelong Labour voter can't vote Labour because of Jeremy Corbyn. We just showed you um, him saying in 2015 that he thought the electorate were right to reject Marxist Ed Miliband. So that doesn't make him sound like a lifelong Labour voter to me. In any case, um, he has definitely changed his tune. He is he's very radical now, Mick Hucknell. This awful, awful Conservative tenure has been disastrous for the UK. This cannot stand. If they won't resign and call a general election, then an all-out general strike seems the only option. Brexit Britain is on its knees. Hashtag pound sterling. Aaron, should the Tories be worried that they've lost the boomer crooner vote? 
the boomer crooner vote. It's not important. It's not remotely important, Michael, because I think most people are going to vote Labour or Tory on the basis of their rent, their mortgage, of their take-home pay with regards to inflation or you know, public services. And you can look at the polls. You know, it's not one or two polls that have the Tories 20, 30 points behind. I mean, there's one poll I'd say, Michael, that would see the Tories on 49 seats. The SNP would be the official opposition. That is not because of celebrities saying they won't vote for the Tories, right? That's because the big macroeconomic and political fundamentals coming apart at the seams, where people have to wait several hours for an ambulance, where people see that they're having to pay a £1,000 more for their mortgage this year than they would have said two years ago. Childcare, you know, issue after issue after issue after issue. The Tories just can't solve anything. They can't do anything. They can't execute on anything. That's why people won't vote for them. So I don't think it's important, but it is significant because people like Rod Stewart, people like Mick Hucknall, they're celebrities. They want to be loved. That's literally the only currency they care about, Michael. You know, I was supporting Jeremy Corbyn and Labour because I thought the policies were right, even when it was deeply unpopular. Because I don't do this to be popular. I don't do this to be, you know, get social cachet and be able to talk to the right people and be Mr. Goody Two Shoes in the public eye. No, I do it because I think this country needs a fundamental rehaul when it comes to its democracy, public services. I think working people need to be put first because they've been second for far too long. And the 1% have been running away with things, whether it's media ownership, whether it's wealth inequality, whether it's effectively what seems to be with the, this conservative government, impunity from the rule of law. We need to rectify that. And that was clear to me between 2015 and 2019. The only way to do that was through a transformational Labour government. And my suspicion is, Michael, any kind of transformational Labour government, which actually offers meaningful real change, which will therefore meet a significant amount of resistance from the establishment in this country, would be admonished, attacked, and castigated by the likes of Mick Hucknall. Why? Because they want to be Mr. Popular, Mr. Nice. Everybody has to like you. You want to be able to go to all the dinner parties and not get any earache about who you're voting for. Why do you support this politician who wants a wealth tax or who might make our houses you know, not go up in value every single year? Heaven forbid, in central London zone one. So it's significant, but my God, Michael, some contrition from these people would be welcome. Because at every turn since 2010, it's been clear this is the route the Conservatives are taking the country down. This hasn't happened by accident. We've had consecutive Conservative governments since 2010 under-investing in public services, freezing the wages of people, for instance, working in the National Health Service, underfunding schools, tripling tuition fees, not building the infrastructure. Uh, where they have had a housing policy, as with uh, help, help to buy in 2013-14, they did that precisely to push the price of houses up. Uh, the same with the freeze on stamp duty during the COVID crisis. So the Tories have been consistent about who they are and what they stand for. I only wish Mick Hucklon could be the same. Obviously, I supported Jeremy Corbyn in 2017 and 2019. I think the country would be a much better place if he got elected. But I do think it is especially telling when someone who calls himself a lifelong Labour voter found even Ed Miliband too left-wing. Because the thing with, with Jeremy Corbyn, obviously, he came with a lot of baggage. Now, a lot of that baggage I liked. You know, it, you weren't just voting for someone who was anti-austerity. You were also voting for someone who was pro-Palestine. You were voting for someone with very strong opinions when it comes to foreign policy. Now, I think he, he tended to be correct on those positions. But I can see how it's consistent that you could say, oh, I don't like what the Tories have done to the NHS, but I also don't like Jeremy Corbyn's position on XYZ. With Ed Miliband, you were literally being offered basically the same government, but one that funded the NHS a bit better and had a mansion tax. And even that was too much for Mick Hucknall. So if now you're looking at the NHS and saying, oh, isn't it terrible what they've done to it? And even Ed Miliband was too left wing for you? Even the mere threat of having a minor little tax on your mansion was enough that you said, oh, let's take a punt with five more years of David Cameron. Then it is very difficult to have any sympathy for you, I'm afraid. Nadim Zahawi has claimed his recent problems with the taxman were careless, not malicious. That might not be much of a defence, though. This was an exchange in Parliament this week between a Lib Dem MP and the boss of HMRC. Mr Harrow, I was just wondering, what does HMRC understand, or what does it mean to imply... Uh, when it uses the word carelessness, that someone has been careless uh, with their tax return? And what should the general public understand by the use of that term? Uh, so, um, I mean, again, I'm not commenting on any particular person's affairs, but carelessness is a concept in tax law. It can be relevant to how many uh, years, back years, that we can assess. 
and it can be relevant to whether people, someone is liable to a penalty, and if so, what uh, penalty they would be liable to uh, for uh, an error in their tax affairs. There are no penalties uh, for innocent errors in your tax affairs. So if you, you know, if you take reasonable care, but nevertheless make a mistake, whilst you will be liable for the for the tax and for interest if it's paid late, you would not be liable for a penalty. But if you, if your error was as a result of carelessness, then legislation says that a penalty could apply in those circumstances. So those are the two occasions when <coughs> HMRC would consider whether non-compliance was careless. When we need to understand what back years we can assess and when we need to understand whether there is a penalty due. Okay, so so carelessness could mean in, you, in your case that they, just to come back to what you were saying, it was an innocent mistake. So a, a not innocent mistake is that the, is that oh, when carelessness uh, I mean, would be? Uh, I use the I use the term innocent. I don't think that's the statutory language. <laughs> uh, the statutory language is uh, uh, despite taking reasonable care. So if you yes. uh, get your tax wrong despite having taken reasonable care with it, then there's no question of us uh, charging you a penalty. You would of course still have to pay uh, the tax. Uh, but if you have being careless in your tax affairs, uh, the, and as a result of that carelessness, have made a mistake, then you could be liable to a penalty for any understatement of tax that you've made. That was the boss of HMRC, a real, you know, a bureaucrat's bureaucrat. And the key line there was that innocent mistakes are not punished with penalties. And we can therefore infer that Nadim Zahawi, who, who did re receive a penalty, his mistakes were not innocent. Sahawi's relationship to the law and free speech has also been put under further scrutiny. And on this week's Question Time, the Mirror's Alison Phillips pointed out how bad his behaviour looks for Rishi Sunak. Surely Rishi Sunak must have called him in and say, hang on a minute, how come I've just found out that what you said to me last week was not the whole truth? And you've made me look an absolute clown. You've, you've, made, you've, you've, you've caused distrust in the country. And this is continuing. And I think the other thing the gentleman there raised, which is really cuts with, for me is the idea that last July, Nadeem Tohawi was using his very expensive lawyers to send out letters to get journalists and investigators to stop looking at this and say, this is not true, I'm going to sue you. We're seeing so much of this in this country at the moment of like mm. very rich people using the law to evade proper scrutiny. And the idea that we've got somebody who's in our, in our government that was doing that, is, it's just appalling, it stinks. And I think Rishi Sunak, when he came out and he said that stuff, at the beginning about integrity and professionalism and accountability. We all thought, great, because that as a country is what we deserve and that's what we want. And he's let himself down. He's allowed one of his closest advisers to let him down. I just think it's a real shame for all of us. Okay. Now, you might not be surprised a Mirror journalist was gunning for Zahawi there. But also on that panel was Jake Berry. Now, he's Nadim Zahawi's predecessor as Tory party chair. And he also thinks Zahawi should stand down. Even though he is a friend of mine, I'm not going to allow that to distract from a view I have put forward consistently in relation to all these sorts of uh, issues, is that the government needs to find a mechanism for ministers and MPs who are under investigation in this way to step aside, to clear their name, and then to come back into government if that is appropriate. I think from Nadim, great individual that he is, that will be the right thing to do now, I applaud Rishi Sunak for fast-forwarding this investigation, which we learnt this week will be concluded in around 10 days. But I do think it's unsustainable for a minister to stay in his post while this investigation goes on, including other ministers who are also under investigation, not least because we have learnt that when you want the public to have faith and trust in these investigations, one of the key things is for that individual to step away from power because it takes away a perception that they have some influence or some ability to alter the investigation because they remain in that position of power. So that answer is also interpreted as a bit of a sideswipe at Dominic Raab, who is still in post, despite being investigated um, for bullying um, his staff. Um, Aaron, why has Zahawi stayed in post? It seems a little bit odd to me. It seems like it would have been an, an easy win to just sack the guy. Well, I think Ash talks about this very eloquently on, on Monday, Michael, I believe, or maybe it was last week. And it's a point you do have to really impress on people is that Rishi Sunak doesn't have much legitimacy amongst his parliamentary colleagues. You know, he hasn't, he hasn't been elected as leader of the Conservative Party, let alone prime minister. He came second to Liz Truss, right? 
Uh, important to say, by the way, Jake Berry was made chairman of the Conservative Party by Liz Truss. So he's not going to be the most impartial person when it comes to uh, who should and shouldn't be in the in the Sunak cabinet. But um, Sunak's position is very, very weak. You know, he doesn't have the Brexiteers on board. He's actually disliked by uh, quite a lot of the party membership and, you know, various chairpersons in, in Conservative parties locally around the country. Uh, he has this veneer of competence and, you know, slickness and whatnot, which is very much a media confection. As we're finding out since he's been prime minister, there isn't really much to justify that. There's not much beneath it. He's never really run anything. He, he worked in finance, but he's never actually run a big organization or been in charge or anything. Okay, he was chancellor before this, and that was during COVID. But other than that, he's had no real senior experience. He was a very junior politician all the way through really to the last general election. And now he's the prime minister without anybody voting for him. And he he, he even, you know, if you look at his run against um, Liz Truss for the leadership over the course of the summer, you know, I think she won, um, but he got more MPs backing him. But he still had a significantly smaller number of MPs than you would traditionally like for somebody who then proceeds to become the leader of their party in parliament. So he's not got much power. He hasn't really got a base. He hasn't got the ERG. The center of the party's really crumbled in the last five years, the former Cameroons. You've got people like Jeremy Hunt there, but actually most conservative voters, particularly the ones they won in 2019, look at Jeremy Hunt and go, who the hell is this guy? What does he stand for? Why does he, why does he even call himself a conservative? So it, it, it's a very strange one, Michael, because this kind of double act of Sunak Hunt, the only way they're going to creep towards anything like a parliamentary majority, which seems impossible right now, is by winning over those wavering Lib Dem Tory voters. It's the only way they can do it. And the number one issue for those voters is integrity, probity, corruption. They often tend to be very do doing very well. They're the kinds of people that shop at Waitrose, that, you know, Owen Jones mocks on, on YouTube and Twitter. Uh, but they're in those Lib Dem Tory marginals, and they'll be the key seats for soon to get anywhere near power after 2024. So it makes the utmost political sense to get rid of Zahawi, he can't because of his internal position within the party. He just doesn't have that, that base, that internal machine, which could see him through if he starts sacking people like Zahawi, who it must be said is a very influential figure. You know, this is, this is somebody who, however briefly, was, was chance of the Exchequer. And what do you think the game plan is? Because, I mean, he's being investigated by the ethics advisor, who, as we've said many times on this before, hired by Sunak, reports to Rishi Sunak. The, the idea he's the independent ethics advisor is a little bit far-fetched anyway. But he's going to have to judge if he's broken the ministerial code. And I, I think that means, you know, if he hasn't lied to anyone, he might get away with it. But the fact that we all know, you know, the, the fact is on the table, we're all aware of it, is that he acted in such a way, and you heard it from the HMRC boss there, <clears> that he has done something which is not an innocent mistake. He has been careless, which means he has not taken the sort of due attention, the reasonable attention that one should take to inform the tax man of what money he had made. Now, I'm not sure if that's written into the ministerial code or not, but it seems like he, he could come out of this saying he hasn't broken the ministerial code, yet everyone in the country will know that he didn't tell HMRC about millions and millions of pounds that he had earned when he should have done. So, you know, is Rishi Sunak going to just say, well, he hasn't broken the ministerial code, I believe, in due process, he can stay in his post and hope everyone forgets about it? Or is he going to potentially lean on his independent advisor to say, can you actually find out that he has broken the ministerial code so that then he has cover to sack the guy? And as you say, if he's weak in, in the Tory party, then if there are some backbenchers who say, I can't believe you sacked Zahawi, he's one of my allies, he can say, look, he broke the ministerial code, what was I supposed to do? Your guess is as good as mine, Michael. I mean, this is all quite sui generis, isn't it? When, when I say sui generis, it's, it's kind of unprecedented. These, aren't, these weren't commonplace debates in, in British politics until the last several years. I mean, as I understand it, Michael, Zahawi did a deal with HMRC around what he needed to pay as the chancellor, mm. right? Isn't that absolutely extraordinary? Forget everything else. Forget, forget whether it was a penalty or a fine, or if he lied, or if he didn't lie, or whatever. Or the fact that he had lawyers going after um, um, accountants and, and, and tax lawyers and journalists trying to uncover the story a year ago. Forget all of that, because that is obviously reprehensible, unacceptable. But just the mere fact that he was trying to negotiate a settlement with HMRC with regards to his own tax, when he was the chance of the exchequer, the person who's determining what your rate of income tax is, the person who determines what the rate of corporation tax is, or VAT, 
or capital gains. He's the person overseeing all of that. And at the same time, he's making a deal with HMRC with regards to his own taxpayers, retrospectively. Even if he'd done nothing wrong, even if it was an innocent mistake, the fact that you're negotiating that deal while Chancellor is extraordinary, unprecedented. Now, you, you could say, again, is that corruption, not corruption? Um, ministerial code broken, yes or no? Uh, it, just, it, just, it just stinks of a complete lack of professionalism, Michael. In any other career, you'd be out. You'd be a laughing stock. You'd be out. Your career would be finished. You know, it's like a CEO of a company saying, I'm trying to maximize shareholder value. Um, and, and I don't know. Uh, I'm trying to think of a good example here. Gerald Ratner, right? He was a jeweler in the 80s, very successful uh, jewelry business. He did an after dinner speech one day and he says, I don't know why people buy all our stuff. It's a lot of crap anyway. The business collapses and, you know, he basically talked down his own business. To me, this is kind of analogous. You're like, we need people to pay taxes so we can pay public services. Oops, I didn't pay mine. Let's negotiate a deal between me and HMRC while I'm the chancellor. It's absurd. It completely unpicks the fundamentals of the social contract between the taxpayer and the government, right? There's, there, you don't have a legitimate political system if, if, if this kind of stuff is happening. And that's bad. That is really, really bad. It goes above any particular politician or political party. It, it really... Um, undermines any kind of faith or confidence in the political system more generally, I think. Nadim Zahawi's political life is currently on the line after his failure to pay millions in tax to HMRC. But the former Chancellor's awkward relationship with state-backed revenue collectors could go even further back than we imagined. This is an ITN News report from 2004. It'll be six months before the injuries to Nadim Zahari's leg are completely healed. But it isn't his shattered limb which is causing him the most pain. He's seizing because as he was lifted into the ambulance after a road accident, a Lambeth traffic warden stuck a penalty notice on the wreckage of his scooter. It was so blatantly obvious. You know, there is no way the traffic warden could have missed an ambulance, a police van, a bike that smashed and eyewitnesses standing there. So, you know, what, what, what was she thinking of? The accident happened as Mr Zahari, who's a councillor for Wandsworth, was riding along the Albert Embankment near Vauxhall Bridge. The area is in Lambeth, who contract out their parking enforcement and the hiring of their wardens to a private firm called Control Plus. There's a police van, there's a, an ambulance, there's a smashed scooter, which is resting against a lamppost. It is impossible for her not to make the connection. They seem to sort of probably work on, on the law of average that the more they issue, the more they'll get paid. And if there's a few that go astray or a few that are issued wrongly, then they can just, you know, say sorry and move on. There's a couple of things to say there. I mean, first of all, fair enough. You know, I would also be pissed off if I'd just been in a road accident and then I got a ticket um, when I'd clearly just fallen off a vehicle. Right. Fair enough. What that clip, which is quite remarkable that it's just been unearthed. I thought it was, you know, quite I was very surprised, essentially, to see a 2004 clip of Nadeem Zahawi on ITN News. I wasn't aware of it. It raises a potential interesting theory, though. Nadeem Zahawi, right now, he has failed to pay tax to HMRC, clearly has an awkward relationship with them. Potentially, he, he's quite angry about the fact that the state is constantly trying to collect money from people. I had assumed that this was just because he was any old rich guy who doesn't want to pay tax. He wants to keep it all to himself. I thought it was all about greed. Maybe it's about revenge, though. Maybe he's so annoyed at the concept that the state can demand money from you because when he was in a car accident in 2004 in Wandsworth or Lambeth, I can't remember which one, he got a parking ticket when he had just fallen off a bike and then he said, I am never going to pay full tax again. Screw it. Screw me being forced to pay the state money. This is not for me. Aaron. Um, do you think we've misjudged Nadim Zahawi? Do you think he has a legitimate grievance? And it's fair enough if he doesn't want to pay the state any money ever again because of that horrible experience where he got a parking ticket after having been knocked off a motorbike. The Nadim Zahawi villain origin story, Michael. <laughs> there's some credibility to it, I feel. Look, there's a few points to make here. First of all, in 2004, the uh, parking enforcement officers responsible were... What's the word? Outsourced. This is an argument against outsourcing because you don't really have the best kinds of standards and practice when you have outsourcing in public services. We know this, whether it's probation, whether it's the NHS, whether it's universities, it's people who just want to basically get on with their job, 
Um, and like he sort of insinuated there, make as much money as possible and sod the rest. And there's very little oversight with regards to actually, are you doing the job effectively? Clearly an effective traffic warden should not be giving somebody a ticket when they're being taken away in an ambulance. So that was an argument against outsourcing in my view. Um, of course, it's probably lost on Nadim Zahar in 2023, let alone in 2004. But it does raise an important point, Michael. You know, I think this is something which has been not really focused upon enough, which is that Nadim Zahawi is an extraordinarily wealthy man, extraordinarily wealthy. I believe that his property portfolio with his wife, of course, they're, they're a single unit, they're married, so the property is, you know, it's, the, it, it's both of theirs, essentially. I don't, maybe they've got a deed of trust about who gets who, but as we understand it, it's their joint, it's their joint assets. Um, you're looking at a property portfolio around about 50 million pounds, almost all in London, I think. That's an extraordinary amount of money, Michael. So for him, him not to be paying his taxes, and also, Michael, for him to be driving a scooter or a bike, very, very strange, very puzzling to me. Uh, I mentioned this last week, but also Nadeem Zahawi was, I believe, chairman of Le Cercle, a CIA-funded think tank, very secretive, Atlantis CIA-funded think tank. He was the chairperson of that, I believe, from 2014 to 2017. Um, he succeeded Rory Stewart in that role. Very, very murky um, think tank, which some claim has influence on UK and European foreign policy decision-making. I couldn't possibly comment. Uh, but it is strange that somebody with that much money, with that much influence, who's that much on the make, in 2004 found themselves not only hit by a car while on a bike or a scooter, I believe, uh, but also whining about it to uh, broadcast news. It can happen to the best of us, Michael. I often complain about landlords on this show. Regular viewers will know that. I get pretty pissed off about the amount of rent I have to pay. But in making a podcast I've been doing, Crash Course with Michael Walker, I had the opportunity, finally, to debate one. Um, so I debated a man called Greg Suman. He is president-elect of the Association of Residential Lettings Agents. He's also a landlord of free properties. I'm going to show you a couple of clips. The first, we're discussing Section 21. That's the part of housing law, which means that landlords can get rid of tenants um, without them having done anything wrong or without them being in arrears. It's called a no-fault eviction. I think it should go. He thinks it should stay. Take a look at his reason why. Every interference in the rental market through legislation and regulation has a direct knock-on effect on those people who are, in my opinion, the most vulnerable in the current housing market. So as a result of the Section 21 being introduced, landlords had um, the reassurance that by investing their money into the private rented sector, um, they will be able to have a, um, a, a fair relationship with uh, their customers, tenants. Now, if we reduce um, the landlord's rights where they think, I may not be able to get a bad tenant out, and it's important to, to, to clarify that no landlord would ever think of evicting a good tenant, um, then there's just going to be less and less supply, which is what we're currently seeing, which is why rents are skyrocketing. So there's a couple of things to mention there. First of all, I think I want to pick you up on this idea that no landlord would ever evict a good tenant. Now, I see what you're saying on, on one level. No landlord would evict a tenant who is paying them the rent they want to receive and isn't causing them any problems. But for me, it could be the case that a landlord says, look, um, property prices are increasing in the area where I own this home. I could rent this property to someone richer or I could rent this property to someone who isn't asserting their rights, because I imagine for some landlords it is frustrating when you've got a tenant who knows the law. And they can say, look, um, I would prefer to rent this property to someone else who might be um, less assertive in terms of the, the repairs they want doing and who might be able to pay more for it. So, you know, from the perspective of, of a landlord, that might make that person a bad tenant or not an ideal tenant. But from my perspective, you know, that tenant hasn't done anything wrong yet. They could still be evicted. Do you see where I'm coming from? Greg did go on um, to accept that the definition of a good tenant might depend on the perspective of the person talking. Um, I want to jump to a different part of the debate, though. This is the bit that really floored me. Now, personally, 
when landlords talk about profits and losses, they say, oh, I'm only, you know, it, the rent is only a few hundred pounds more than my mortgage repayments. I'm not I, I'm not rinsing this property for money. I'm not exploiting these tenants because I'm not making a massive profit. Well, you might not be making a massive month to month profit. But at the end of this whole process, you've got someone else to pay for your mortgage. And at the end of the at the end of this whole, you know, rigmarole, um, where someone has been paying 50 percent of their earnings to you every month, you have a very valuable asset. You're sitting on a big asset. So I don't really see why landlords expect to both make a month to month profit and acquire a very valuable asset at the end of it. It seems like they want their cake and and to eat it. You'll say, I want someone else to pay my mortgage and I want them to pay above and beyond that as well. Now, to me, that doesn't seem particularly fair. That's not a, a fair relationship. And that's why I'm you know, very frustrated as a as a renter, because I feel like I, I'm giving so much of my earnings to someone to buy them a flat. Well, the argument there, and, and we can dissect it because there, there are several points you made, and they're all very, very valid. Um, so firstly, why is it that you're not a property owner? Why is it, and I'm, I'm, I'm saying you, I mean, why is this hypothetical tenant not a property owner? Why don't they buy their own property uh, and pay off their own mortgage? So that, that's, that's point one. Point two, I agree that when there are profits, we can have this conversation. But when there is an £850 a month loss that the landlord has to subsidize somebody's rent by every single month in a market where house values have fallen, uh, and the prediction is that they could fall further. Now, why would a landlord stay in this market? Why would they not just sell and maybe return to the market when conditions become more favorable? Don't like renting, just buy a house. Um, that was the message, um, I think. I should say, I, I was I was recording that as a podcast, so I didn't quite realize we were going to be putting it out as a video, but then the video was quite good. But you could see a lot of washing in the background. I was actually at my sister's. She's just had she's she's just had a baby, right? So so give her a break. Uh, it wasn't the tidiest of lofts. Uh, I probably would have sorted out the background. Um, Aaron, what did you make of that? Don't like renting, just buy a house. I think it's brilliant that you went straight to the horse's mouth and got this degenerate nonsense, quite frankly, Michael, a few things. You know, he says, a good, you know, landlords don't want to evict a good tenant. I can only imagine that he's qualifying, quote unquote, a good tenant as somebody who does absolutely everything the landlord asks and will pay any increase in rent that the landlord ever stipulates. That's a good tenant. Okay. If, if this person will literally do anything that they're told to do and they'll pay any price that they're demanded of, that's a good tenant. Okay. Well, I think that's a, I think that's a strange way to phrase it, but there we are. Um, and in terms of the money making, Michael, you know, I often listen to the property podcast. It's a very popular podcast amongst people who <clears throat> are in the buy to let sort of game. And it was really interesting to me, Michael, because I was listening to their predictions for 2023 and they give, you know, where they would like to go. And by the way, it's not good. They're all saying, if you're in the South, go North, you know, go to Liverpool, go to Manchester, go to Derby, um, go to Glasgow. The one that really stuck out though was, was Derby. They said Derby's fantastic because it has good paying jobs. You've got Bombardier, you've got, you know, industrial manufacturing jobs nearby. But the rent's still really cheap. Well, that's not good. Well paid jobs, but housing which doesn't take an absolute, you know, bombshell out of your wallet at every payday. Well, that's not good. We have to rectify that. We're advising you to go and buy property up in Derby so that you can, you know, obviously have an appreciating asset in terms of value, as you talked about, Michael. But you can also make a nice healthy profit too. This is about making money off other people, of their suffering. And it's important to say, housing is like such a fundamental thing to live a decent, meaningful life. There was a story a few days ago, Michael, of a, woman, a young woman, I believe, of Cantonese heritage. She was renting a place in, in West London, £900 a month she was paying. She couldn't afford to eat. She was having to choose between housing and food. She felt ashamed of her situation. I believe a younger woman finding her way in, in the world of work. She killed herself. She killed herself. That is what these people are doing. That is what these people are doing. Now, it's not direct, but there's clearly a causal relationship between millions of people feeling their lives as shit and people like this gentleman and the interests he represents with regards to landlords and renting. He said, oh, well, the housing market isn't necessarily good. Property prices are actually going down. It's nonsense. Stop lying. Yes, we've had a few bad months, but if you look, for instance, at uh, 2020 to now with COVID, Michael, you know, you're looking at property value increases in many parts of the country, 20 to 25%. 
what in the last few months they've gone down maybe two or three percent. They're still up, you know, a fifth to a quarter in the last two to three years. So this idea that oh, actually property is now going down, it's not all, it's not all, um, you know, uh, apple pie and, uh, and 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 lullabies and sugary sweets for landlords. They have to have the bitter lemon too. It's ridiculous. You're talking complete nonsense and baloney. You know, these people are destroying the lives, frankly, millions of people. They're not providing a service. Oh, well, if the landlord wasn't making any money, then they'd have to, they'd have to sell the property. Great. Let's have a massive influx of property onto the market, have a massive increase in supply, and the prices will go down. And maybe some of the people that are renting will be able to get a place of their own and have a little bit more security than they do with people like the, gen uh, the, the, the people that this gentleman represents. It's outrageous. It's an outrageous way to run a country. It's an outrageous thing to try and defend. Put on your suit, put on your tie. Oh, that's it. Nice haircut. Bit of, uh, you know, Emporio Armani. Why can't you just buy a house, Michael Walker? What's wrong with you? Why can't you just buy a house? You know, a little Mont Blanc pen. There we go. Calvin Klein underwear. Why can't you just buy a house? It's not that easy, mate. <laughs>